So that's the twin towers in a nutshell. The Pentagon, of course, is we're told that it's a Boeing that's hitting the wall of the Pentagon. Well, it would be something like this, according to the official story. And of course, you've got to imagine one of these basket case characters, Honey Hun Jewel in this case, he's somebody who couldn't get a license for a small plane, hypercover Cessna. Nobody would rent him one because they wouldn't trust him. He's probably somebody who couldn't get a driver's license in most American states, with the possible exception of New Jersey. <laughs> and nevertheless, we're told that he can equal the Red Baron in his ability, because he can come down to 270 degree turn, and then he flies at about two centimeters off this turf, which is not singed by the jet exhaust. So this is quite a feat. And again, many airline pilots have looked at this and said, <laughs> even with my 15,000 hours, I can't do it. Maison, the French uh, leader of our international movement, Thierry Maison, put this out uh, within a couple of weeks, pointing out, how do you get a 38-meter wingspan into a 19-meter hole? And this is after the facade collapsed. Because at the beginning, the hole is much smaller. And then more of it collapses as a result, not of the impact, but of the fire. And that's where the Boeing went. The Boeing disappeared into that hole, says the U.S. government to you, and you're expected to believe that. This is a real prison house in the mind. The Boeing went in there. Now, there are certain diehard supporters of the, in this case, of the official version, who say, yeah, but there's, much, there's a bigger hole down here. The water is covering up the real big hole. But again, you can see how big is that. And the entire wall above it is intact. So the Boeing went in there. You're expecting to and I hope you don't, because it didn't. This is obviously a cruise missile. It's obviously something with a shaped charge, an armor piece in warhead or something like this. Here we are in Shanksville. And again, the problem here is, where's the plane? You don't find a plane. They said that the airplane went into that crater. Well, fine, dig it up and reassemble. They can dig it up from the, they bring it up from the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, from TWA 800. Where's the plane? The plane is either not there, or it hasn't been destroyed at a much higher altitude by some very powerful agency that has scattered small pieces over a large area. But even that is extremely unlikely. So we're left with a real puzzle. What is with the Shanksville aircraft? And there's another version. The Boeing went in there. They say there's an abandoned mine underneath. Well, where's the plane? Everybody has a favorite uh, Achilles heel. I mean, this is a this is a story with so many Achilles heels. It's difficult to know where to begin. Um, I was just listening to a guy on the radio the other day. He said this is his favorite story. Where's the plane? As he said in his New York accent. This is the other, the, the great Achilles heel is of course Building 7, the one that they don't tell you about, which collapses at 5.30 in the afternoon, even though it has been hit by no aircraft, and the fires involved are very small, and its fall is perfectly symmetrical, it doesn't tilt towards the wreckage of the, of the buildings. And of course, you all know the embarrassing moment for the BBC, where the charming lady from the BBC tells you that the Salomon Brothers building close to the World Trade Center has collapsed, Building 7, except the poor lady. We look over her shoulder, and there's Building 7, and it hasn't collapsed. And it won't collapse for another 22 minutes. So how did they know in advance that it's going to collapse, unless it's controlled demolition, which it obviously is. And of course, the BBC is not the only one. There are others who also... I was in Berlin, Germany that day, and the German television was saying the building was going to collapse. CNN said it was going to collapse. Okay, here are the two towers. Here's the South Tower. Here's the North Tower. Here's Building 7. Here's Building 6. This is an interesting story. Where did we get this huge crater blown in the roof of Building 6? That's another story in itself. But notice that Building 7 is separated from the main complex by a street. This is called Vesey Street here in Norman. And then there's no way that debris which did not destroy this building is going to go across and destroy this one. And in any case, that would have then tipped it towards the side of the debris, and instead we don't have that. The other interesting effect here is the molten metal, which remained in pools in the sub-basement for weeks after the 
the event, and of course there is no way that this could have been uh, generated by, by jet fuel. But the, the evidence that interests me now as we move towards the, uh, towards the conclusion, um, I'm interested in the political evidence. Other people do more with the technical evidence than I do, but nobody seems to be interested in the main technical evidence. These are two things. One is the ultimatum of the coup faction to Bush, and secondly, the fact that you have 25 plus drills going on. Bear with me. Here's Bush in uh, Sarasota at the Booker Elementary School, and he's in the fifth grade reading class with the teacher, and they're going to do My Pet Goat. They, they, he doesn't read My Pet Goat, by the way. The children read My Pet Goat to him. It's important to defend them, uh, but we have to keep it straight. Okay, 9.03 a.m., the second plane hits the South Tower. Now, under any normal circumstances, this means that something is going on. The Secret Service is supposed to pick him up, carry him out, take him to a secret bunker location. They can't leave him in the school where everybody knows that he's there. It's like saying, you know, anybody got any assets? Why don't you have a go at him? He's basically being offered, he's hung out to dry, and hung out as a target for the coup faction to take a pass at. They had options that day. Keep Bush in power as a puppet, liquidate Bush and have Cheney, or have a committee of public safety. They had that one too, and they had that there. Now this is the moment when he's told the U.S. is under attack. Now I was up in Vancouver in Canada a couple of months ago. Gillian Norman, Gillian Norman is actually from Yorkshire, so she's part of the Yorkshire School along with me. She is a great Australian documentary filmmaker. She's, they're going to be launching her film Shadow Play in uh, March, February, March. If you want to escape from the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, go to Australia next March, February and March, and you can have a, a kind of a road show from Perth to Melbourne to uh, Sydney to um, essentially the, the very warm area north of Sydney, a beautiful area. They're going to have all this stuff. So anyway, she said, what she thinks Card is saying is Angel is next. In any case, Angel is next is the threat that arrives at the Secret Service sometime between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning, meaning Air Force One is next. Angel meaning Air Force One. This warning comes with a series of top secret code level code words from across the entire top of the US government, from the CIA, from the Pentagon, the NSA, the DIA, and all the rest. In other words, the people issuing this threat are the top of the US government in terms of permanent bureaucracy and other operatives. And it is an ultimatum to Bush saying, you must now launch the war of civilizations by attacking Afghanistan, by saying terrorism, by saying Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And if you don't do it in conventional form, we have code words, we can do it in nuclear form. We have the code words necessary to launch nuclear missiles. And don't you forget it. Now, I have a debate with the Canadian authority, Barry's Ricker about what is this man thinking? And Barry's version is something like this. <laughs> <laughs> My plan is working. I will conquer the world. I will sweep aside all opposition. And I will wage the war of civilization. That's more or less his version. That this is the complacent face of a man whose evil plan is coming to fruition beyond his wildest dreams. My, my version is a little bit that's a nice